Alright, we're going to be reading out of Genesis chapter 13. We're going to read the whole chapter of Genesis 13. Y'all like reading the Bible? Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Alright, let's start. Genesis chapter 13, and it's 1 through 18. It says, And Abram, this is before God changed his name to Abraham, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord, and Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite. And the parasite dwelled then in the land. You know, I didn't really put this in my text, but I kept noticing that. Every time I would read the passage of Scripture, and the Canaanite and the parasite dwelled in the land, you know. Here we have Abram and Lot, who are both the children of God, followers of God. They've embarked. God's called Abraham out by name, told him to trust him and to travel towards the place that God was going to bring him. And now in the midst of the world around them, they're full of strife and chaos. You got to understand and you got to know that the world is watching you. The world is watching you. The world is watching me. And the world watches the way that we respond one to another and with one another. I hate to admit it to you, but I can't, it just came to my mind. I remember one time there was a time that we were all in Shoney's. It was me, Robert, and somebody else. And me and this other person were getting into a discussion about the Lord. And it got heated because we had a disagreement. And the next thing you know, his voice was raised. My voice was raised. Probably the other way around. My voice probably raised first. It doesn't really matter. But when it was all said and done, people were looking. And I remember when we all walked out, you know, when it was all said and done, we shook hands and we went our separate ways. But I remember Robert made the comment, you know, the world's watching. Amen. The world's watching. And they, they heard what y'all were talking about. Y'all were sitting there arguing about the Lord. Amen. I'm not saying that we don't ever get into heated debates, but there's always a time and a place for various things to take place. Amen. And, and I'm just letting you know that the world was watching Abram and watching Lot and watching the fact that all this contention and strife was, was taking place. So it goes on to say, <clears throat> And Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee. And that's another way of saying, I beg of you. Between me and you, and between my herdmen and your herdmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate yourself, I pray thee, from me. If you will take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you depart to the right, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and he beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Behold, before the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. <clears throat> Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou see to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth... Then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, 
and built there an altar unto the Lord. And for the next however long this message is, I'm going to minister to you on a title called The Path Less Traveled. Before I get into a little bit more of the introduction of what I want to talk about, I just wanted to point out to you that the context behind this story, many of you already know, is that Abraham, there was no nation called Israel. We've talked about this many times in the church. This is at a time frame when God has no nation. This is at a time frame whenever the Tower of Babel, according to what the Word of God says, whether you believe all of the stories of the Bible is really up to you. Maybe somebody watching by video says, oh, I don't believe all those stories. Well, if you study hard enough, you will find, like I can remember one time when I was trying to prove this point, I came across two Russian linguists. I mean, you want to talk about smart. These are people that study human language. And they determined... Now, they were atheist Russian linguists, and they determined that all languages originated from one human language. The Word of God teaches us that at the Tower of Babel, they were of all one language, and when God confused their languages, they began to disperse and disseminate across the land, and they made up the different nations, but yet God had no nation, and He called a man named Abraham out from his father's house, and he said, come out of your father's house, come away from your people, away from this land, to a land that I will show you because I am going to make a nation out of you. And so Abraham embarked on the journey after he heard the word of the Lord. That's all he knew. He didn't have this body of work we call the Bible to look to, but he had had one clear word from God. Trust me, start out on your journey, and I'm going to bring you to the place that I would have you to go. Now, one other thing that I want to say, because I didn't really put it in my notes, but I wanted to point this out, is that whenever Abram gave Lot the choice, he said, look to the left. If you choose the left, I'll go to the right. Look to the right. If you choose the right, I'll go to the left. The Bible says Lot lifted up his eyes. Lot lifted up his eyes and he saw the plain that it was well watered and that it was good. And that's what he chose for himself. But if you go down, I believe it was in verse 14. What the, what the word of God says is this. The Lord told Abram to lift up his eyes. There's a big difference whenever we make choices for ourselves and we operate in our own logic and our own wisdom versus operating in the will of God whenever God speaks to us. And that truly is the path less traveled. Most of the time we don't operate according to what the word of God says. Most of the time without us realizing it, we operate according to what we want rather than what God wants. You know, there's a passage and I don't really need you to go there. I'm just going to talk about it a little bit out of Ephesians chapter four, verses 11 through 24. The essence of this passage talks about the fact that Jesus gave gifts to the church. It talks about the fact that he gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. He gave those gifts to the body of Christ for a purpose. The purpose is so that the people of God could be equipped to do the work of God. God has a will and a plan that his people would be matured, perfected, equipped to do the work that he's called them to do. Well, what is the work that God's called you to do? You know, for so long I went to churches where everything was so focused on the ministries that were in the building that we completely lost sight of what God's will truly is. God's will truly is that his people would be a light that shines in the midst of darkness so that the world around them would know that there's a real God in heaven that's creating an eternal family and that if they would believe the plan that he has provided, then they could also become part of that plan. God wants his people equipped to be able to do the work of the ministry, and that is the work of the ministry. He's called them that they would no longer walk according to to the way that the other Gentiles walk. That's what Paul would say. If you go back and you read that passage in Ephesians, Paul would say, listen, God gave you apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers to equip you, to teach you, so that you would no longer walk like the other Gentiles walk. Now, we, sometimes we've got to go backwards before we can go forward, but you should know by now, many of you do, and those of you that maybe don't, maybe somebody watching on video, that the Gentiles he's talking about were the nations or the people that had not previously known God. Because it, because it was God's people that he created in Abraham that he gave his word to. All these other nations were worshiping false gods, fallen angels, demon spirits. Statues of Apollo, statues of, you know, false 
gods in, in South America, but whatever the case, they were following after false gods that were leading and guiding them in lies that was moving them away. And so therefore they were void of the knowledge of God. That's what Paul would say. He says, you should no longer walk like the other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their own mind. What is it talking about vanity? It means emptiness. They are void of the knowledge of God. And so therefore their knowledge that they have received from the world around them and the teaching that they have received from the world around them has caused an emptiness in their mind. They don't know the ways of God and you ought not be walking like they walk. If you've truly been taught the truth of what is Jesus. You should not be walking the way that the rest of the world walks. Amen. Because you've been instructed Amen. Sure. in the ways of God. Ultimately, Paul tells them that the right way to walk is to be renewed in the spirit of the mind. The believer that is renewed in the spirit of the mind will have an understanding about the difference between the old man born in Adam and the new man Born again in Christ. Boy, that's some powerful. Seems real simple when you've been studying it for a long time. But it's real important that we have a revelation of that. We really need the people of God to have a revelation. That the first time you were born, you were born like your father Adam. You were born bound in sin. That's what Adam is the fountainhead of all humanity. That's what the Bible teaches. Each and every last one of us come forth from Adam's loins. Adam was fallen. He was full of sin. And we have an inherited a DNA from Adam that calls us to be sinners. When you broke forth in water from your mother's womb, you were already born a sinner. We're all in the same boat, folks. None of us are any better than the next one. That's why it required God to bankrupt heaven and to provide this fallen earth with the most precious prized possession that heaven Hallelujah. held. Amen. It was Jesus, the sinless one. Hallelujah. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst men. The word that became flesh that had no sin bore the pain of sin bore the power of sin upon his person, died at the cross and paid the penalty for you and for I. And hallelujah, the old man born of Adam dies in Christ. And a new man born again in Christ is resurrected to newness of life. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about what the word of God teaches. How many conversations have you been in with people in the past and, and they're like, well, I'm a Christian. I'm just not one of them born again Christians. Well, then, brothers and sisters, you got a problem. Uh, hold on, Houston. We got a problem. Time out. Stop what we're doing because the word of God says that unless a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's right. I'm not talking about what I was taught as a child that you get sprinkled with water when you're a baby and that's how you're born again. No, there's no time ever in the scriptures where any baby was ever baptized in water. Let me tell you what, what the word of God is talking about. It says in Romans chapter 6 verses 3 through 5 that when a man is born again, when, essentially what it's saying is this, is that God sent his son to die on the cross and the old man born of Adam comes to an, an, a, an age of accountability where he understands intellectually, cognitively, that he is a sinner. He is not right with God. He hears the truth of the gospel and when he hears that, Jesus is the answer and he puts faith in what God's plan was and I'm talking about believing not with the head but with the heart. Amen. How do you know the difference, preacher? It's not up to me to know the difference. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There's a whole lot of people that believe with their head but they never believe with the heart. Amen. The Bible says you must believe with the heart and confess with the mouth. And when you do that, the Bible teaches that a miracle happens in the spiritual realm. Amen. The old man born of Adam is baptized or placed into Christ and in the mind of God that old man travels back with Jesus at Calvary, is nailed with him there. You've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. That's Galatians yes. chapter 2.20. The old man born of Adam dies with Jesus, is buried with Jesus, placed with Jesus in the tomb and just as Jesus rose on Sunday morning, hallelujah, yes. the new man in Christ is born again. And he's a new creation is what the Bible teaches. How do you explain that? I don't know how to explain it to you, but if you've never been born again, you need to get born again so that you can feel what I'm trying to tell you because when the weight of sin lifts off of you and the burden of your past lifts off of you, it's God the Holy Spirit moving in and the reason he can is because you've now been clothed with the righteousness of Jesus and because you're now clothed with the righteousness of Jesus, the Holy Spirit has now made your heart 
his home. You have now become the literal New Testament fulfillment of the Old Testament tabernacle. Yes. Where God's presence was dwelling in the midst of that tabernacle with his people. Mobile on the journey with his Old Testament people. Now he's on the inside of you. He's mobile on the journey. Everywhere you go, you bring God with you. Amen. Amen. You're not supposed to be walking like the old Gentiles of the Gentiles. Well, they don't know God. They don't know the eternal plan of God. They're just living for today and what their eyes see and what they want. <coughs> they only live for today. Their decisions are based solely on what they believe is best for them. They can't take into account what God may want for them because their minds are empty of the ways of God. Unfortunately, many Christians live their lives this way also because they haven't learned Christ. They haven't learned the word of God for the way that God intended for it to be understood. <clears throat> that they are no longer the way that they were, but instead are new creations in Christ and therefore can no longer live their lives the way they want to. This passage that we read out of Genesis, it creates the concept of the carnal versus the spiritual Christian. The carnal Christian would be the one who has believed God for salvation, but continues to live his life like the old man, making decisions based on the way things look like Lot did instead of based on the knowledge of God. Whereas the new man is led by the spirit and makes his decisions based on the knowledge and connection that he has with God. The story that we read about Abraham and Lot <laughs> provides us with this thought. Abraham is the spiritual believer who has embraced the word of God and is following the spirit for the plan for his life, whereas Lot represents the other. He is the carnal or fleshly Christian. He says he loves God, but his decisions are made outside the knowledge of God. He depends instead on what makes sense and what looks best to him. Not what God really wants for him. That brings me to point number one. You ready? The choices we make result in the paths that we take. The choices that we make result in the paths that we take. Can you turn to Ephesians 4, 13 through 14? I just wanted to show you the scripture. Sometimes our path can get skewed, right? Sometimes we can go off the road a little bit. This passage is still connected to the one we talked about earlier in Ephesians, about God giving apostles and prophets and evangelists. You get it? And that, that the whole purpose is that they would teach us the word of God so that we could be equipped properly. And so ultimately, so, so this would happen, that we could all, who's all? He's talking about the body of Christ. Yes. So that we as the body of Christ could come into the unity of the faith. I don't mean to get all technical <laughs> on you, but whenever the definite article is right there, the Faith. Do you understand that the faith encompasses God's eternal plan of salvation for mankind? Faith is a verb. In order for you to enter into the faith, you must use the verb faith. See, the faith is a noun. It's the plan of God, the salvation plan of God, the redemption plan of God that said man was guilty. And so therefore he had to send the innocent one to die in place of the guilty one. Okay, but in order for you and I to come into the unity of the faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. He's not talking about sinless. Only Jesus was sinless. He's talking about come to a place of maturity. Yeah. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God desires that we would be molded and on a daily basis we would be conformed into the image of Christ. Amen. That every day we would look more like him and less like us. And look at this. That we henceforth would be no more children tossed to and fro. I'm trying to tell you that the choices that we make affect the paths that we take. And false doctrine, improper teaching will cause you to be like a rudderless boat on an open ocean that causes you to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. You know, one of the things I was thinking about is oftentimes when we read this passage of scripture, we think about false doctrine. We think about a preacher behind a pulpit somewhere and he's teaching the word of God in a way that it's not right. And, and that's really what the context is. But do, do you not understand? I mean, do you not agree with me? And if you don't, it's OK. But do you not agree with me that the world has its own form of doctrine? Yeah. It has its own form of doctrine. It has its own preachers. It has its own spirit. The world is being driven by the spirit of Antichrist. <coughs> Television, Hollywood, oh, here the preacher goes telling me not to. I, 
I watch television. But I'm going to tell you right now, don't think that some of that stuff that we watch doesn't end up in some way, shape, or form affecting our mindset. And they're purposeful in it. They're trying to indoctrinate us with their ways and their will. Amen. Their music is trying to indoctrinate us with their ways and their will. When we spend enough time with them, I'm talking about the Gentiles that are darkened and have void in their understanding of the ways of God. They don't have the knowledge of God. They're empty. And they, what are they filled with? The world around them. They're filled with the knowledge of the world around them. And they will begin to try to indoctrinate us. If you go back and you look at chapter 12 of Genesis, and I'm not asking you to turn there. But if you go back and you look at chapter 12 of Genesis, which is the chapter where God calls Abraham out. And it's right before the chapter we just read. You will see that as soon as Abraham starts his journey, after he heard from God, that he built two altars. I just wanted to make the point that this is a type of faith in the work of Christ. The Old Testament altar is fulfilled in the New Testament cross. The Old Testament sacrifice is fulfilled in the New Testament Lamb. Well, what are you talking about, preacher? John the Baptist on the banks of the Jordan River said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus came to fulfill all the Old Testament sacrificial system and the cross. God used it to be the altar yes. that fulfilled the Old Testament type. <clears throat> Abraham built two, two altars, and this is a type of New Testament faith. Faith in the work of Christ, because it was through offering sacrifice to God that they were able to access his presence. The song was perfect this morning that we came to the altar to pray because he says, I don't want to go back to my old life. And he talked about being in the presence of God. This scripture, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, we use it a lot. But it says this, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I'm talking about the fact that the choices that we make affect the paths that we take, that we need guidance from God and we don't want to be indoctrinated with lies because if we're indoctrinated with lies, we're not going to be able to make the right choices. We're going to end up on the wrong path, but that if we make the right choices and stay in God's will and, we're, and we've been made right in the eyes of God, we now have access to grace. Hallelujah. Access to grace is like having access to his presence. On the day that the old man that was born of Adam put faith in Christ and he was over here put in Jesus, died with him, buried with him, resurrected to newness of life. The Bible says that he's now been clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. Hallelujah. Because you have the righteousness of Jesus clothing you, you now have access to God's presence. You don't need another man to get you into God's. Jesus. The Bible says there's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus was enough what Jesus did, hallelujah, when he died on the cross and paid the penalty for your sin. The Bible says you have access into grace, access to his presence. God sent Jesus to die for our sin. And when we believe in his plan, he allows us to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Can you put Galatians 327 up there? I didn't have this in my notes before, but during song service, I felt like God wanted you to see it. It says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put him on. Another translation says you've been, you've been clothed with Christ. If you think the mindset, okay, well, I was sprinkled with water or I got dunked in water. That's not what it's talking about here. It's talking about what I was telling. Yes, yes. When you get dunked in water the way that they baptize people in the scriptures. There's only one place where somebody was sprinkled with water as a baby. That's in the book of Samuel. And that was whenever uh, Hannah dedicated Samuel to the Lord. All right. That was a baby dedication. All right. That's another story for another time. When you get baptized in water, what that is symbolized outwardly is what I've been talking to you about that takes place inwardly, spiritually. When the old man dies in Christ and is buried with him, that old man, when he's dunked in water, is buried in Christ and the new man is resurrected to newness of life. You are buried in the water, 
Now you come back to newness of life. What it's talking about here in the original Greek text is talking about the fact that when you believe by faith, water never saved nobody, folks. Jesus said that ought to just sound right to your heart. That ought to sound right to your head. That water couldn't save nobody. Jesus had to save sinners, hallelujah, <laughs> from themselves. Praise God. And when you put faith in Christ, then guess what? You were baptized into Christ. You Just like you get baptized into the water and, and theoretically you become one with the water, you became one with Jesus. You were buried with him and now you've been clothed yeah. with Jesus. You put him on. And because of that, you have access to the presence of God. This is what Abraham was doing in the Old Testament fashion, believing God's word, which said that if you want to walk with me, if you want to hear from me, you will have to offer sacrifice to me. There will have to be the shedding of innocent blood to keep this relationship right. That, you know, that just mess up all your religious works, won't it? I mean, think about it. That's why you know it's God's will. You know it's God's plan. You're going to try to live for God according to all your... And believe me, Lord knows I've tried to do it before. My own works, trying to accomplish something in my own strength. And the whole time God's saying, what are you doing? The only way to have a right relationship with me is you've got to come through the shedding of blood. I love that story about Cain and Abel. Because, you know, the Bible says that Cain offered vegetables... But Abel offered a blood sacrifice. You know, in order for Cain to have been right with God in that situation, because God comes back and tells him that he's not right with him. In order for Cain to have been right with God in that situation, you know what he would have had to do? He would have had to humble himself, go to his brother, and shed innocent blood. The heart of man in his pride and his self-righteousness does not want to hear that Jesus had to die on the cross. Because of him and his sin. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is that's exactly what the gospel is saying. If there's going to be a right relationship between man and God, then there's going to have to be bloodshed. But suddenly the Bible says, I'm talking about the fact that Abraham began his journey, making the right choices, building altars as soon as he left and heard God's voice. But then the Bible teaches that suddenly there was a famine in the land. And Abraham made a decision to go to Egypt to seek help. And he told lies to try to protect himself. He failed God. God never told him to go there. He puts the plan that God has for him in jeopardy. It's like the Ephesians passage where he's being tossed to and fro without proper direction. He's coming off of a mistake in chapter 13. I just wanted you to know that. Call it a mistake, a failure, a wrong turn. Call it whatever you want to call it. But he went the wrong direction. And now in order to get back right, he knows he has to go back where he started. Look at Genesis chapter 13, verse 4. This is where he went in, in chapter 13. Unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. He went back to the first place. His first action after his failure is to go back to the place where he built the last altar. He went back to the starting point. I'm talking about the choices we make affect the path that we take. I want you to see how critical this is. I don't want us to just pass over this. I want you to see how critical this place is physically that Abraham. You know, God, I keep saying this. God's such an awesome author. <laughs> Amen. Give me some of your wisdom, Lord. Help me write a little bit more like you, Lord. Amen. I don't know if the world would want to read it, but uh, I mean, I, I wish the Lord would let me have some of his wisdom in a little bit. It just amazes me how he does what he does. <clears throat> Look at this. Genesis chapter 12, verse 8. It, Abraham's going back to this place. This is where he first built the altar. Look where he built this altar. And this is where Abraham is now before him and Lot have to separate places. He removed from there unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and he called upon the name of the Lord. He's between two places, Bethel and Hai. Anybody know what Bethel means? House of God. Bethel, house of God, 
And then the other place is called Hei. In this passage, sometimes it's called Ai. Anybody know what that place means? Heaps of ruins. <laughs> he stands between two places at the altar. One place is the house of God. The other place is a heap of ruins. Abraham's already made mistakes. He's already made failures in his life. He comes back to the cross. He comes back to Calvary, which is a type of Christ and what Christ has done. The very place that he began his journey. The same place that you began your journey. Because if you ever started the journey, you had to bow your knee to the fact that you were a sinner. And that it required Jesus dying on the cross for your sin. And many times we go off the beaten trail. We go out of the way that God would have us to go. And in order to get back on the right path. Path, we're going to have to go right back where we started from the beginning. And every time we make these choices, you got to understand something that on each side of us, there's either the house of God or there's a heap of ruins. The choices that we make affect the paths that we take. In all of our lives, we stand between these two places and our choices lead us in one direction or the other. I think that was my longest point. Point number two. The Spirit will lead you into a blessing that God has, but you can't see. The Spirit will lead you into a blessing that God has, but you can't see. Go back to Genesis chapter 13, verses 8 through 9. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and your herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Abraham and Lot have crossed a place of testing in their journey with God. They've, they've come across something that they're going to have to make a decision about. I want you to know that the walk of faith is full of tests along the way. Can anybody give me an amen on that? That's right. The walk of faith is full of tests along the way. Tests that you don't really know where they will lead and you're left only to believe based on the word that you have. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 verses 36 and we'll read through chapter 11 verse 1. I'm just going to break it down as we go. Y'all remember the book of Hebrews, what it's about? People that used to be Jewish in their religion have given their heart to Jesus because of that, they're being persecuted. When you first got saved, did your family persecute you because you left the religion that they always knew? Kind of happens a little bit. They were being persecuted. But they are being persecuted way bad, if that's a proper way to say it. But he says right here, you have need of patience. The word there means endurance. This isn't a word, but stick to itiveness. You can't quit. You can't drag up. Daddy would have said, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, boy. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. But we're talking about spiritual endurance. Hupomone, remain under. That after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Don't quit in the midst of the battle. The promise lies ahead. Yeah, sure, you're going through persecution. Don't go back to your old life. Don't go back to your old ways. You got to endure the trial. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. Jesus is coming. Amen. Hang on. And he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. Until he comes, you're going to have to continue to live by faith. But if any man draw back, this is God talking now, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Can't go backwards. Can't quit on the Lord. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now look at this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for with the evidence of things not seen. 
faith, God will bring you to a place that you can't see, a place that God has for you, but you can't see it. Abraham doesn't know exactly where God's bringing him. He's crossed a path and he's come to a place where there's strife and there's confusion and he does not really know where he's supposed to go. For these Hebrew Christians, they couldn't see anything but pain and heartache. They certainly didn't feel like they could see the promises of God for their lives, so they were tempted to quit. But true faith doesn't operate on what it sees. It operates on what God says. Amen. Abraham heard God and believed his word. For Abraham, it was easy to make a selfless decision and allow Lot to have what he wanted because he was able to trust the promise that God would give him a land for his descendants to live in. Whereas people in the world would have expected Abraham to take what he wanted. After all, God had promised it to him. So he should have exercised his right and chosen first, but he offered the first choice to Lot. One who believes that God is committed to provide for him is not greedy. He's not anxious. He's not covetous because he knows that God will take care of him. Logically, it didn't make sense to what Abraham did, but he had been with God. He had gone back to Calvary. The hill where the cross was. And every time we go back to Calvary, we will be led to focus. Now this, I've been reading a lot of words. So, so let me just make sure I got your attention. Right here. Every time we go back to the, to the cross, we will be led to focus on the big picture of God's plan and how our lives fit into that plan. Decisions must be made based upon God's overall big plan that he has and how our lives fit into that plan. If you're trying to make decisions for your own individual life that are contrary to the will of God overall, then you've missed the Lord. You're outside of God's will. Don't be surprised when there's chaos. Amen. Don't be surprised when there's strife and confusion. You've walked outside of God's will. There's no other way to, to, to nail it down. You want me to water it down? You want me to dilute it? And then, and then we're confused by the time we leave here. We don't even know what we're talking about. No. When you make a choice for your individual life that is contrary to the overall will of God that he has planned for this world, which is for people to surrender and bow their knee to him and to walk with him and trust in him as he saved this whole God-forsaken world, then you're out of God's will for your individual life. That's good. If it don't line up with the word of God, you done took a detour. And sometimes when God is speaking to us, when we're hearing his voice, it doesn't always make sense. Amen. Amen. That's right. The book of Romans 12.10 says this. It says, for, to you, for you to be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and to prefer one another. Abraham preferred <laughs> Lot over himself. But Abraham knew that God had a plan for his life. Amen. And in this story, Abraham and Lot are brothers. That means they're both followers of the Lord. You keep bowing your knee and giving preference to the people in the world around you and see what they do to you. <laughs> Lots of carnal Christian, but at least he's a Christian in this story. Abraham says, let there be no strife, I pray they, between me and thee, for we be <laughs> brethren. At this point, Abraham might not know exactly where he's going or exactly what God has for him, but he knows that it's not God's will for him to live in the middle of all this strife. Amen? Amen? I might not know where the Lord's bringing me, but I know that this ain't God's will right here. Point number three, the flesh in your eyes will lead you somewhere that God didn't see you. Faith is the substance of things hoped for with the evidence of things not seen. You got to be able to trust the Lord that he's going to lead and guide you in the right direction. Look at what it says, Genesis chapter 13, verses 10 through 11. And Lot lifted up his own eyes. We could say it that way. And beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere. You know, they had all these herds. They had all these sheep. They had this cattle, the buyer, King James calls it. It seems to make it make sense. You'd want the plains of the Jordan Valley that are well watered and green and lush so that your animals can eat, right? It looks, makes sense. The carnal mind can't understand the things of God because they're spiritually understood. If the carnal mind is disconnected from the word of God, he'll never understand the things of God. Right. He'll just plot along on this crazy fallen earth and he'll make decisions based on what looks best to his logical mind. 
It says that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar, then Lot chose them all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Your flesh will bring you to a place that God never meant to send you. And you'll make choices based on your eyes instead of your heart that you hear from God. Lot, Lot made his choice purely on the fleshly level based on what looked good to him through his human senses. Abram's decision to let Lot choose first was a choice made by faith. With Abram not looking on things temporary and worldly, but on things spiritual and eternal. It was connected to God's promise. You know, there were two main differences between Abraham and Lot. Number one, Abraham followed the spirit. Lot followed the flesh. Number two, Abraham was selfless and sacrificial, whereas Lot was selfish and wanted to please himself. I've been, I can't lie to you, I've been having a conversation with somebody lately, and the more I talk to this person, the more I realize that almost everybody in this person's life is selfish towards them. It's not just that person that I've been talking to, though. You probably will experience, you have experienced people that are completely selfish towards you. They take, they take, they take, they want, they want, they want, and they ain't never really <laughs> reciprocating and giving nothing back. Amen. And if you let them, they'll just keep on taking more. Amen. Hold on a second. Well, first of all, if they're not of the Lord, you ain't got no hope. If they're not ever saying that the Holy Ghost will live in their heart, they ain't never going to turn around. Now, maybe if they've been saved and the Holy Spirit lives in their heart, there's some hope for them. We'll get to that in a second. But, but the point that I'm trying to make right now is, is that, that that's what's going on. Lot is selfish. I mean, Abraham, the reason that Lot's being blessed is because he's hanging out with Uncle Abe. I mean, God's blessing is all over Abraham, and Lot's just getting the overflow. <clears throat> Lot like, looks at that lush George house. He's like, man, that's what I want. He makes that decision for himself. Abraham's decision kept him on path towards God, whereas Lot's decision brought him closer and closer to the world. Look at Genesis chapter 13, verse 12 through 13. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Lot's choice brought him close to the cities of sin, and ultimately he ended up in Sodom. Slowly but surely, the ways of the world weighed upon and had their effect on Lot and his family and the choices that they would make. I would imagine... <coughs> That when it first started, and this is just pure speculation on the preacher's part, I can't prove it. But I would imagine that whenever Lot first camped his tent towards Sodom, I mean the Bible teaches that he moved closer and closer. If you go back and you read the story, at some point in time he's actually sitting at the city gate conducting business with the city officials. So now he's like knee deep all up in them, with them, rubbing shoulders and holding, you know, whatever men do. <laughs> but but what I but what I want you to know is this is that he probably thought that he could change the world around him. There's been times that I've been tempted in the past to be honest with you to be a politician, just so I can get up there and just start talking, you know, because I love to talk. But you ain't gonna change them. I'm telling you right now. Now don't get me wrong. I, I need to go vote Tuesday. I got to a point there for a little while where I wasn't even gonna vote no more. I was so disgusted with government, but I'm gonna go vote. Got to come back to balance, man. But can I tell you that, that the war ain't going to be won with a bullet or in a, in a boat voting booth, but instead the war will be won on our knees praying and asking Hallelujah. for the peace of, the Prince of Peace to return? That's right. Amen. 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 Lot, you ain't going to change them. <coughs> You're not going to change. Now, the God in you, if they grab a hold of him, he will change them. And that's God's will. Amen. Maybe he thought that he could change the world around him, but instead the worldliness of those around him changed Lot and his family. Point number four. We're going to finish. We're going to do this last point in five minutes. Abraham had to separate himself from a follower of flesh whose actions were selfish. The Bible says in verse 11, they separated themselves the one from the other. Earlier, Abraham said this, we are brethren. 
You know, it's a shame when believers have to separate, but sometimes it happens. In this case, one was being led by the spirit and the other one was being led by the flesh. The result was strife, creating a frustrating mess. But how much worse is it when the believer connects themselves with the world that isn't even serving God? How much strife then? How much frustration or mess will there be in that circumstance? The result of them staying together was a big old crowd of strife. That's what I see. I mean, I try to put myself in the midst of that story. And all these herdsmen, and they're like, one's Abraham's men over here, Lot's men over here, and they're over here facing one another. They're like, hey, you should do it this way. No, we're going to do it that way. Yeah, well, he should have done it like this. And it's just and nobody can agree on anything. I, you know, I always, whenever I think of this, I always go back to the Jerry Springer show. I think that show might still be on. Is it? Do y'all know? I don't know. I think sometimes when I go to the gym at lunchtime, they got the television on there, and I kind of see them going up, and I'll see somebody sitting down, and the next thing you know, they jump up, and they run over there, and they start beating up there. I, the point that I'm trying to, why do I even bring that up? Because I saw the Jerry Springer show a couple of times. <laughs> And I just feel like at some point in time in my life, my life was kind of like that. It was so messy. So full of drama. You know what I'm saying? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all ever been around like that kind of stuff? Hmm. Y'all still like, yeah, I know what you're talking about, preacher. I kind of like that yesterday, maybe. I can't really handle that stuff no more, man. I go crazy when I'm around people and all they do is just drama and mess. And chaos and strife. Amen? Abraham said, we got to separate. Now, let me just say this. Let me be careful. If it's truly another child of God, you got to be careful on how you separate. You got to, you, you, you can't, you're not trying to hurt somebody, right? You, you're not trying to hurt somebody. It doesn't mean that, they, that God will never get a hold of that person and that you shouldn't pray for them and ask God to do a work in their life. I'm just talking about maybe y'all not go hang out in their living room on their couch and sit there and listen to all the strife, all the chaos, all the confusion, unless you like the Jerry Springer show and you like being part of it. But if you hang around that stuff long enough, sooner or later, somebody about to get up off the couch probably and it's going to go just from being worse to something else if you're around that kind of strife. That's all I'm trying to get at. Hey Amen. I'm not trying to say you got to be ugly about it, but in order to go God's direction, you can't stay there. That's right. And if you will trust God for the other person and your heart is right, then God can also do a work in them. Amen. But as long as you stay in the midst of the mess and they don't see that there's a change of direction for anybody, then they just keep on thinking, oh, yeah, then nobody, there's nobody there to tell them. There's nobody there to let them know. Separating spirit from flesh. Look at Galatians 5.17. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These two are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things you do. Spiritually speaking, this is talking about spiritual strife. That's, what I, this is how I would describe this. Spiritual strife. Your flesh in you is fighting against the spirit of God in you. And the spirit of God in you is saying what he doesn't like about the flesh in you. And there can be turmoil. Whatever you're going both ways. You know what I'm talking about? You ever felt spiritual strife before in your own life? Spiritual strife in the life. And spiritually speaking, whenever you're going both, trying to do both at the same time, it causes strife in the midst of your heart. But do you know that there can also be a physical strife? And that's kind of like what the story is talking about. I just wanted you to see this. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says this. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. That's old King James language for saying this. This is how the ESV says it. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Amen. Just like there can be a spiritual strife that's taking place on the inside of your heart. One pushing against the other, the other pushing against the other, causing a conflict in you spiritually. The same truth holds for whenever you are constantly in the presence of another person that is contrary to the will of God, contrary to the ways of God, they will begin to corrupt upon you. Just like the world of Sodom began to corrupt upon Lot, it will sooner or later also happen to you. That's right.